Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about an extremely practical method in data science called approximate nearest neighbors. Now what does this sound like? Obviously it sounds like k-nearest neighbors, and in fact it's trying to achieve the same goal as k-nearest neighbors, but it's going to be fixing one of the biggest issues with k-nearest neighbors. And before we get into that biggest issue, let's remind ourselves about how k-nearest neighbor works and what it's trying to achieve. So given I have some data, let's say it's just simple two-dimensional data, so all these red X's you see are my initial data points. And let's say a new data point comes along, this black X right here. K nearest neighbor says that go find me the K closest neighbors, literally physically in space, to this new data point. And so for example, if K is equal to three, I think anybody, even if you've never taken a math class, would say that the three closest neighbors are these three red X's that are right here, and you would be correct. And from there, you can do various things. If you're using k-nearest neighbor for classification, then you might predict the label of this mystery point as the majority label of your three closest neighbors. If you're using this for some kind of natural language processing, then each of these uh, points might represent a word. So you might be embedding your words as points in space. And if a new word comes along, you might care about who are the three words that are closest, most similar to me. So lots of applications, but the main point that you're always trying to do is that given some point x, so this x is now a variable, not the same as these uh, symbolic x's here. So given some new point x, you want to search your training data to find the k closest neighbors to that point x. Seems intuitive enough, and if you have a small data set, obviously it's not going to take too long. But we live in a world of big data. So let's think about what happens when you have n points, where n is something like million, 10 million, 100 million, many, many data points, and you want to find the k closest neighbors in that data set, what is the big O? If you're not familiar with big O notation, basically just if I give you twice as much data, how much longer is it going to take you to find the solution to this problem? And we find that it's big O of n. And to see that, let me kind of walk you through how we would do this. It's pretty much a brute force search. So let's say we're trying to keep track of the three closest neighbors. We might initialize those as indices 0, 1, and 2 at the start of the algorithm and we would get the distance between the first, second, and third point and this mystery point, and we would just call that d0, d1, and d2. And then we would do this very brute force thing of just scanning through all n data points in our training data, and each time we get to a point, we compute the distance between that point and the mystery point, and if that distance is ever smaller than any of these three current minimum distances, then we would replace that with the current index we're looking at. And so in that fashion, at the end of the day, after we scan through all n data points in our training data, these indices would be updated with the correct three closest points to this new point here. And so to be quite honest, there are a couple of more moving parts than just the number of data points. For example, the dimension of your data also matters. The bigger the dimension of your data, the longer it takes to compute the distance between two of these guys. Uh, K obviously matters also. If there's a lot of neighbors you're looking for, that's going to complicate things. But to keep things focused, to keep things targeted today, we're going to be saying K and the dimensionality of your data is fixed for now. The only thing we're looking at changing is how many training data points do you have. And so if I give you twice as many training data points, you have to search twice as many things. Nothing more you can really do. And so we're saying this is big O of n. In a nutshell, big O of n says that if I give you twice as many things, you have to do twice as many operations. Um, and I, I want to make it very clear that if you are indeed looking for the true three closest neighbors or five closest neighbors to some given point, this is really the best you can do. You have to visit every single point because any given point could be one of your closest neighbors. So this is the best you can do. And so I say that because approximate nearest neighbors isn't some kind of magic bullet that finds the three closest neighbors in some less amount of time. Instead, the goal of approximate nearest neighbors is what if we got the almost closest neighbors? What if we got a pretty good approximation to the three or five closest neighbors, but in a fraction of the time? And that is the name of the game for approximate nearest neighbors. So we'll be looking at one approximate nearest neighbor solution here, but I want to make it very clear that this is not the only one. Anytime you go from a exact solution, such as k nearest neighbors, to a approximate solution, many people are going to find many different ways to go about this to make it increasingly efficient, increasingly faster, increasingly better on other metrics. And so this is just one way which I enjoy because it is easy to understand, as complicated as it looks right now, I'm going to break it down for you. 
and because there's code for it, you can just run, so it has a lot of good things going for it. This method is called annoy, which is a funny name, even funnier when you find out what it stands for. It stands for Approximate Nearest Neighbors Oh Yeah, designed by some very smart folks over at Spotify. Speaking of, I will link a, the original article for Approximate Nearest Neighbors Oh Yeah in the description below, so you can read about it from the person who designed it. So let me describe how this works to you. We're going to be assuming we have just 16 data points. Of course, if you're using this, you're going to have a lot of data. That's the whole reason you'd use it. But to keep things simple, we have these 16 data points in two-dimensional space. And so how does this work? The first thing we do is that we pick two data points at random. And let's say we pick data point 1 and data point 9. And so that's represented by this top layer of this tree. And this tree structure is going to be crucial to understanding how this approximate nearest neighbor algorithm works. So the first node says that I picked 1 and 9 randomly. The next thing I do is I draw the line which is equidistant from those two points, and that is this blue line here. By equidistant, the easiest way to think about that is, for example, if I drew the connecting line between these two data points, it would be the line that's perpendicular to that connecting line and equidistant from both points. So this line effectively separates the space of points into two pieces. And looking through this tree, we're going to adopt the convention that anytime you take the left branch, you are looking at stuff below the separating line you just drew. Anytime you take the right branch, you're looking at stuff above the separating line you just drew. So now let's take a look at what goes on below the separating line we just drew. Below that is this cluster of points down here. And we're going to keep going, we're going to keep splitting based on some criteria we have. And today's criteria is going to be that we need to keep splitting until we have at most three data points in each region. And currently this whole bottom part is one region and we have five data points there. So that's our signal to keep going. So let's say we split again and now it just proceeds just as we did before. We pick another two random data points within this region. Let's say we pick data point one and data point four and then we draw the equidistant line again, which is now this red line here. If we look below that red line, we have data points 4, 5, and 8, 4, 5, and 8, and we can stop separating stuff in that region because we've achieved this three data points or less criteria. And we're going to call that region R1. So let me grab my marker and label it on the diagram too. So this becomes region R1, and we're done. Let's take a look at what happens above the red line. We've also met the criteria there. We just have two data points, 1 and 13. We're going to call that region R2. So we're done with those. We have these two regions in space. And now we just keep going. Now there's also stuff to do above the line. I won't go through all the details because I think you start to get it. How about we just do one more to make sure you understand it. So above the line, we have all these data points. We pick two at random. Let's say we pick data point 6 and data point 12. And so 6 and 12, that leads to this purple separating line here. And so the region above 2, 12, and 15, that's done. And we continue splitting down here. So at the end of the day, after we've done this whole method, we have the tree that you see on the right-hand side here. Now the big burning question is, why did we just do this? What's the point? Seems like a cool thing to do, but how does this help us find the k closest neighbors, approximately, to some given point? It actually helps us a lot, and more importantly, helps us do it in a very efficient way. So let's do that by just showing you a couple examples. Let's say that we have a new data point, which is, oh, you know what, before I do that, let me finish labeling the regions in space. So 2, 12, and 15, that's going to be R3. Then R4 is 3, 6, and 10, so that's R4. R5 is 9, 16, 11, so that's R5. And then 7 and 14 becomes R6. Okay, good. So we can match up the tree to the diagram here. So let's say I have a new data point that comes in right here, and I want to ask who is the closest neighbor to me. If I was using original k nearest neighbors, I would have to basically just scan through all 16 of these data points, compute the distances, and I would find out the correct answer is uh, maybe 8. But how do I use this structure to do that in a much more efficient way? Well, I just traverse the tree. So I start at the top of the tree, and I ask, is this new data point here? above or below the blue line, and it's below the blue line, so I travel down this side of the tree. Then I ask, is this new data point above or below the red line, and it's below the red line, so I travel below here, and now I am in region 1. And now here is the crux of the approximate nearest neighbors algorithm. Now that I'm in region 1, which consists of only points 4, 5, and 8, I only check the distances between my mystery point and these three points here and then I find that the closest neighbor would be 8. 
What we're doing intuitively is that when we constructed this tree, we did it in a random fashion, but we've created these regions in space such that points that are near each other usually appear within the same region. So that all I have to do to classify some kind of mystery point or figure out who's the closest neighbor to some kind of mystery point is figure out which region it's in and then only search for neighbors within that region because that's going to be some kind of localized pocket of space. And in some sense, I should be safe to only search that region. Let's do another example. For example, let's say we have data point all the way up here. So traveling down the tree, this is above the blue line and then it's going to be below the purple line. And then the orange line, it's above that. And so that lands us in region four, which is the correct region that it's in. And so now we only have to search three, six, and 10. And we find that three is the closest neighbor and we got it correct. Now, it is important to think about the drawbacks here. And why is this called approximate? Where are the places that can find the not correct answer? Uh, for example, for example, let's say I had a data point right here, right below that orange line. Now the true answer for who's your closest neighbor is obviously six, but you can probably see what's going to go wrong. After we go down this tree, we're going to land in region five. And so we're only going to be considering nine, 11, and 16, and the closest neighbor of that would be nine. But you can also see why this is not like catastrophic. Usually if you have like 1 million, 10 million, 100 million data points, usually in applications like that, you're okay with a little bit of error. You don't want, it's okay if you don't find the six, as long as you find something that's close enough which is this nine here. And that's really it, folks. We're gonna go through some considerations in just a moment, but if you understand the way this tree was constructed and how it matches up with this diagram and how to use this tree, then you're pretty much fully understanding how this approximate nearest neighbors would work. And, and let's think about why it's faster. I guess that'll segue over to this last page here. What is the big O of this guy now? If we have n data points, notice what we've constructed here is basically a binary search tree. We're just gonna go down one route or the other at every single node. And so we know when we have a binary search tree, we're basically cutting the size of the problem in half approximately with every branch we go down. And that kind of behavior leads us to a big O complexity of not n as we had in k-nearest neighbors, but log n. So we have gone from something that is order of n in complexity in terms of how many data points you have to search through to something that is order of log n. And just to make sure this log n behavior is clear for anyone, every time you go down a part of the tree, you're basically saying, oop, throw away everything over here, let's search this part of the space. Then you split again and say, throw away everything over here, let's search this half of the space. And so you're basically just cutting the problem half, 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 half each time until you land in whichever region you're in, and then you just have to do some fixed number of comparisons to figure out who are my two or three, whatever closest neighbors. And that's why it's order log n. So this is the biggest thing it has going for it. Let's think about one of the drawbacks though. On this page over here, we only constructed one tree and we could have gotten really unlucky. We could have gotten pretty bad splits since we did this fully randomly. And so something that the approximate nearest neighbors oh yeah algorithm does is that instead we construct, instead we construct a forest, a forest. So what that means is that we don't just construct one tree, we can construct a whole set of trees, similar to the spirit of random forests being collections of decision trees. We construct several trees that look like the tree we had before, but each tree is gonna be a little bit different because of the random points we choose for splitting. And just as we had the logic with random forests being a better version of decision trees because we're averaging over lots of different uh, combinations, lots of different possibilities for what could have happened instead of just one, we have the same exact logic here, where maybe we don't find the best closest neighbors with just one tree, but when we look at the uh, result of the best closest neighbors across many trees, which are similar but different in slight ways, we're gonna get better overall performance. Of course, one of the other drawbacks would be that when we have a forest of let's say 100 of these search trees, you have to obviously store them somewhere. So this approximate nearest neighbors does require some additional data storage. But if we're willing to accept that data storage, we get a huge speed up in finding the neighbors which are closest to me and doing it in a way that usually finds pretty good approximations. So usually this is still very worth it, okay? So that's all I have to say on approximate nearest neighbors. There's many other methods, some of which are similar to this guy, some of which are very different. But this annoy method is pretty fast in my experience, and it's also pretty intuitive and easy to understand what's going on. So if you learned something in this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Oh yeah, by the way, 
Um, you might have noticed we've gone back to the marker and paper format. I just want to feel out if you like this format better or worse. I've gotten comments on both sides. I'm not really partial to the whiteboard or the markers. I just want to do what's best for you. So if you want to leave some feedback on if you like this format or not, that would be much appreciated. Um, like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.